Well, good morning, class. It's morning for me. It may not be morning for you when you're watching this, but as you can see outside, even though it is November 5th, two days after election day, uh, we are experiencing a little bit of Indian summer, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Although <laughs> I wish it was a reality, you know, if wishes could be fishes, I mean, this would be spring coming on. Winter would be in the past, but unfortunately winter is yet to come. So I thought I would go ahead and record out here outside where it's bright and even warm enough to be out in this unheated room. And I'm going to do next week's lesson too, either right after this in the afternoon or tomorrow to take advantage of the outdoorsiness. Is that a word? I don't know. Um, uh, you can't see, but I'm sitting here uh, in shorts. I broke out the shorts again. I wore jeans for the last, you know, couple of weeks. And uh, so now I have the opportunity to uh, be a little bit more relaxed in wearing uh, shorts for a few days. This is series two, episode five of the grab bags. Ding, 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 ding. I want to remind you of the ground rules that when I mess up, I mess up. We just keep going. And uh, if you would, sign in. Let us know that you're watching. We appreciate that information very much. I'm going to talk to you about unity. Unity. And uh, that's a crucial topic with today's political climate especially. And uh, in the aftermath of the election, you know, we're still talking about Republicans and Democrats and divisions. And uh, it's just, uh, I was going to say too much to behold, but it just kind of, it, it does kind of weigh on you. Um, but I, I thought it would be a good topic to address. And of course, I'm going to be speaking about um, unity, particularly in the church. But uh, many people, including moi, are gravely concerned about the unity of our country. After all, we call ourselves the United States of America, and the Constitution uses the wording in order to form a more perfect union. In other words, uh, America is meant to be a country that's always growing stronger. And, you know, Joy told me, Rob, you touch your face too much when you talk. And she's right. I'm sorry about that, but I guess I just have an itchy face. So I, I hope that doesn't bother you too much or distract you. Here I am scratching my shoulder. Yeah! Uh, anyway. Um, the state of our union these days seems to be unraveling with a social distancing that is not caused by a virus other than the spiritual virus of sin. You know, Satan's purpose has not changed. It has been and still is a purpose designed to separate, to cause division, conflict, mistrust. But Neither has God's purpose changed. And God's purpose is reconciliation, bringing people together. In fact, bringing people to himself and to each other. The world is living, or God's purpose is the world living as one. And one day, according to scripture, that will become a reality. That will happen. And that is the beautiful promise of heaven. The lion will lay down with the lamb. Swords will be turned into plowshares, and then the world will live as one, not by imagining there is no heaven, but in the reality of heaven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God, Jesus said. Well, if we desire God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then our commission is to be people of peace. And peace doesn't just magically appear. 
It doesn't just happen wishingly. You, you know, it, as Jesus said, peace is made. We are peacemakers. And I think peace is made through the evangelism and the social service that God's people carry out. Part of the seasoning effect of Christians as the salt of the earth is bringing peace where discord exists. We are peacemakers, and that may come at a price to us, because being peacemakers as individuals and peacemakers as a church involves us in a spiritual conflict, a spiritual battle, where Satan is out to damage and destroy relationships. God wants the world to live in peace. God especially wants the church to be united. But he knows that, unfortunately, there are always those outside the church and even those inside the church who enjoy a good fight. Until evil is eradicated, as God promises, there is potential for division in homes, in marriages, in business alliances, in schoolrooms, actually anywhere that people interact. Now, we're especially aware of the divisiveness that is tearing apart our country these days, like a cheap piece of cloth. Unfortunately, those spiritual forces that stir dissension outside in the world continually pound at the church doors and the church walls like storm surge against the beach, demanding admittance in order to wreak destruction on God's family. What Satan is doing outside the church to tear people apart, he wants to bring inside the church with the same purpose. Now, Paul saw the roots of this destruction growing in the Corinthian church, and he addressed it. In 1 Corinthians 1, beginning of verse 11, he says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, no, I follow Cephas. And still another, well, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided, Paul asks? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? These are rhetorical questions. Brothers and sisters, I mean, Paul did not write these are rhetorical questions, but these are rhetorical questions, obviously, that he's addressing to the Corinthians in the church. Brothers and sisters, so these, these are church family members. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. In other words, this divisiveness, or some say divisiveness, uh, this tearing apart, this setting up different parties over here and establishing ourselves apart from everybody else by simply saying, this person baptized me and that person baptized me, and I'm of Christ. And he's saying, this is worldly behavior, you know? And he's saying, I can't address you as infants because, or adults because you're still acting like infants. This is childish behavior outside the church, especially inside the church. This is childish behavior. And this is worldly stuff. This is the way the people of the world act. He says, you're still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, then are you not mere human beings? 
what, after all, is a palace? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but it's God that's making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but it's only all about God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. That's, that co-workers, of course, is a, a word signifying unity. We're together in this. We're just co-workers in God's service. It's all about God. And you are God's field, God's building. See, the church was divided by name-dropping Christians who were spouting the names of their evangelist mentors, whom it would seem that they treated like they were religious rock stars, you know? And that bragging was, and that bragging was building barriers between people like sport team fanaticism does between Steeler and Ravens fans, or Steelers and Browns fans or Steelers and Bengals fans, or Steelers and Cryboy, I mean, cry, Cowboy fans. Hmm. Steelers play the Cowboys this weekend. But you get the idea. You know, anybody who plays the Steelers, I guess, there's some kind of division. There's some angst, anger. Well, Paul is saying that, that's, that's kind of what it was like. You know, you're fighting over who your favorite evangelists are. You're causing division. And, you know, we could say, somebody could say, well, you like Andy Stanley? Yeah, well, I like David Jeremiah. Yeah, well, I like John MacArthur. He has the word from God. No, no, it's Joel Osteen. No way! It's Terry Irwin. Such was the division, the religious division. And Paul was saying, look, guys, this is totally unacceptable. In fact, it was more than totally unacceptable. It was devastatingly sinful. Now, James also warned about divisions. In chapter 2, verse 8 of his letter, he wrote, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself, then you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Titus received these instructions from the Apostle Paul. Be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one. This, you know, this is part of doing what's good. No slander to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, being hated and hating one another. In other words, there was division between us. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. And so later, he, Paul says, Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Those are some pretty strong words and some pretty strong instructions against people who are tearing apart the unity of the body. In Romans 12, 6, Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Pride, conceit, they cause division. You know, in this case, it was, I don't want to be seen with you. You know, you're beneath me. 
In Galatians 5, Paul writes, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Now here, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, Paul writes, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when you think of acts of the flesh, you know, I think sexual morality, debauchery, orgies, those things that are mentioned here, probably physical sin is what we think of when we think of acts of the flesh. And so you may have been surprised to hear in that list of acts of the flesh things like jealousy, envy, selfish ambition. Those aren't external acts. Those are things that people can hide. Those are things that are internal. But yet Paul says they are acts of the flesh. They are some fruits of pride. These uh, jealousy, envy, selfish ambition. Those are some fruits of pride. But yet they're often the causes of the dissensions, the factions, and the division that Paul mentions in that list. Pride has many different feuds fruits that spew toxic vapors, which in turn destroy relationships. So why does Paul list these internal things like jealousy and um, factions and division? Why does he list those as uh, acts of the flesh? Well, from a biblical perspective, the flesh, you see, is that which is contrary to the Spirit. Let me uh, read for you Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians 5, 17. Paul says, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. So the flesh and the spirit, according to what Paul says, are two opposing forces that are living in conflict and fighting for control within believers. See, sins of the flesh are more than just physical sins like sexual immorality. The sinful flesh influences people's minds. It influences people's thinking into believing that what is wrong is right and into acting out for selfish reasons. You know, the sinful flesh only responds because the mind tells it what to do. And so the sinful flesh, even though it's the acts are external, there are also internal acts, so to speak, in a, in a thinking that begins to say, well, it's okay to do this, or what is wrong is right, and I'm okay to carry that out. In the word flesh, if you drop the H and then reverse the letters, you get the word self. And self is the focus of the flesh. And according to what we read in Galatians, Paul says that that fights against the spirit. And it causes division inside a person because they're in conflict spirit fighting flesh, but it also causes division uh, externally 
because instead of fighting for unity and striving for unity and you know, peace and, and uh, working together, people are out for themselves, for selfish ambition. And that causes factions and divisions. In other words, me becomes more important than you or us or we. And maybe that's why Paul lists selfish ambition prior to dissensions and factions on his list of sins of the flesh. Because this selfish ambition, the self, causes dissensions and factions. It undermines unity. It is an act of the flesh that is out for its own desires to satisfy itself, even at the expense of unity or relationship with others. There is a book that I read recently and I would highly recommend it, Dancing in No Man's Land. This book was written by Brian Jennings. The subtopic title is Moving with Peace and Truth in a Hostile World. And I just can't say enough about it. When I started out the book, I thought, okay, this, the more I got into it, it is just such an excellent treatment he uses like 1917, um, the, the First World War, when troops would fight in bunkers. And there was a no man's land in between. And so he talks about how we can be divided. Me and my bunker, you and your bunker, and there's a no man's land in between. And the person who tries to walk in between and help bring peace is a peacemaker. That's a very difficult place uh, to navigate. And so he says, we're moving with peace and truth in a hostile world, dancing in no man's land. It's, it's, it's just an, an excellent book that I would recommend. But on page 13, uh, Jennings writes this. Getting along is a huge deal to God. The eight sins, and those are the ones I read in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 21, those eight sins drive wedges into relationships, churches, and countries. They divide and fracture. Greek scholar Kenny Bowles says the following about factions. The Greek word for choosing up sides was hieresis. In addition to its use in political situations, it was often used in the context of choosing to join a particular school of philosophy. In this sense, hieresis was a selection or a choice. He writes, it's natural to want to choose upsides, natural but wrong. When Paul listed the works of the flesh, the acts of a sinful nature, in Galatians chapter 5, he included the plural form of the word hieresis, which of course translated means factions or choosing up sides. And for those who are led by the Spirit in the community of Christ, there is no room for choosing up sides, forming sects around favorite leaders or pet doctrines. By the time hieresis came into the English language a thousand years later, it had come to mean heresy. You can kind of hear it. Hieresis, hieresis, heresy. Choosing the wrong doctrine. Now, folks who see the word in the King James Version often misunderstand, thinking that the sinful act lies in choosing the wrong leader or the wrong doctrine. That's not true. The sin is in the very act of choosing. Carnal men choose up sides while Christians stand together. So heresy is, heresy is just to choose a side and to cause 
the division. In Romans chapter 8, Paul wrote this, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. And this is like I said, we're going back to the conflict between the flesh and the spirit, the acts of the flesh. People who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and ah, peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So Paul is <laughs> kind of like saying, here's, here's a real division. The vision is between those who live by the flesh and those who live by the Spirit. And by the way, a little subnote is, it's our job to get rid of that division by going to those who live by the flesh and bringing them into the family of God and into a unity of the Spirit. See, divisions in the church are caused by the same fleshly desires that afflict, that afflict women and men unbelievers. Desires like power, control, admiration, etc., etc. They're all fruits of pride. And so we want to stay away from heresies. We want to stay away from choosing sides, from causing factions and division by carrying out acts of the flesh because we are thinking with a fleshly mind instead of thinking in the spirit and having life and peace. Satan is the lord of the flesh, and his desire is to influence bodies and minds to behave contrary to God. God only wants unity. Satan wants division, and so he wants people to carry out the acts of the flesh. Well, Jesus knew the danger of division and partisanship among believers and in the church. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for unity. He writes, he writes, John writes, Jesus prays, my prayer is not for them alone. In other words, not just for my uh, disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, those coming into the family through the gospel. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I just want to emphasize here that this is what Jesus said. How will the world know that Jesus came from the Father? When the church acts in unity, when the people of God love each other, it's a testimony to the divinity of Jesus. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He says that they may be brought to complete unity. The whole idea is that they may be perfected in unity. You know, this is a process this growing together, that they may be perfected. And the whole idea of perfected is to be, to be complete. And Jesus is praying that the church would grow into wholeness, that the church would grow into unity, that they would be perfected and come to complete unity. Full maturity is the idea. And what James wrote, 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So James is saying the same thing, that, that God is using whatever purpose he can to bring the people individually and the church wholly to complete unity, to complete maturity, not lacking anything. He wants the body to be fully mature and complete in all of its parts. And that happens when individual Christians are perfected when they're made mature and complete. And those Christians growing in Christ, becoming more like Jesus, become integral parts in the body. Like peace, unity does not magically happen. It takes work and sacrifice to establish and then to maintain unity of the Spirit, to keep the unity of the Spirit. And that's what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, when he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So let's break that down, and then we'll be done. Paul says, make every effort. Literally, the word means to make haste or speed. You say, well, how do you get make every effort out of that? A word that means haste or speed. But the idea is, Paul is saying, do it now. Don't delay. Put this, don't put this work off. You, you, you be diligent. And that's another uh, definition of the Greek word there. To be diligent. You, in other words, you get to it and you stick to it. Do it now. Don't delay. Make every effort. Don't let yourself get distracted. This is a primary purpose as a member of the body of Christ. And you make every effort, he says, to keep or preserve. And the Greek word there means to keep watch, to guard, to maintain with watchful care over what you have. My understanding is to put it in just like layman's terms, value what you have. Don't let unity slip away through neglect. You preserve it, you guard it, you watch over it. Now, I, I, I try not to throw out a whole lot of Greek, because I, I don't know, like the guy said, I knew a little Greek, he ran a deli in New York. Ah, 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 ah. And you know, I'm not a great Greek scholar. I know my way around it and can navigate it somewhat. I think it's important to point out here that in the Greek, the word translated to keep or preserve is in the present tense. And the reason I tell you that is because the present tense indicated durative action or ongoing action. And so when Paul wrote keep or preserve, he wrote it in the tense of this, is, this doesn't stop. You know, and when we add to that the idea of diligence, get on it now. Keep at it. Work hard at it. Don't stop. Maintaining unity is work. And we've got to be diligent about it. You know, do most buildings just up and fall over? Do riverbanks collapse suddenly? Well, most often their falls are due to neglect and or erosion. The same is true, you know, for marriages. And the same is true for unity in a group or a church. Paul is expecting believers to not settle, to be alert and proactive in making unity occur. Excuse me. Now look at the word unity. No surprise there. In the Greek, it means oneness, unanimity, unison. That's a good word. It's not cloning. It's not like everybody in the church becomes a Stepford person, you know, like 
they all came from a cookie cutter. It just simply means that we're singing the same music from the same music sheet. We're balancing each other. We're enhancing each other. You know, one of the things that I've learned in music over the years when I sang with choirs is, or even when I sang in the quartet, there are times that you drop your voice back. There are times you drop out so that the soloist can uh, be heard and listened to. And there are times that you have to have equal pitch. It's, uh, you know, you don't just get up and start singing and everything falls together. You got to practice it and you got to maintain the unison singing from the same sheet, enhancing each other. And that's what Paul is saying. Keep or preserve the unity, and the way you do that is to enhance one another. You've got to maintain everybody singing from the same sheet music, and of course that's the scripture. And he says the unity of the Spirit. Not just any unity. I mean, we're concerned with unity in the United States, and we need to do our best to maintain that unity where we can to uh, encourage one another, where we can to step back and let somebody else step up and do what we can to maintain that unity. Paul, of course, is talking about unity in the church, and so it's a unity of the spirit. It's a unique oneness through a spiritual connection with the Father and the Son. It's only available to the body of believers. This is the unity Jesus prayed to the Father for. And he says, unity of the Spirit, then he uses the phrase, through the bond. And the word bond there in its verb form signifies being chained together as prisoners were chained together. Now that's only for illustrative purposes, because I don't want you to get to thinking that this unity of the church is a prison system, and it's a burden. That's not the idea. This word, in the Greek, simply illustrated being chained together, and the illustration for that was prisoners who were chained together. But the unity of the Spirit, the bond of the Spirit, is a special spiritual bonding. It occurs through the, through the Holy Spirit. It occurs through the blood of Jesus because we become brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says, well, let's back up. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of, and he gives a specific bond, the bond that binds us together, that holds us together in the body of Christ, is the bond of peace. And that, you see, is what we're working toward against the division that Satan wants. We're working toward peace. The word peace signifies an agreement between people, a bit like a signed treaty. It implies looking out for the welfare of others. So here's the big picture, that God reconciles. And the word reconciles simply means to bring together, to come together. And so God brings peace by bringing us to himself. He brings make peace between us and himself. Remember we said that yeah, we read all, that people of the flesh, you know, they're hostile to God. And so they're against God. And there used to be an old... Uh, Broadway show that said, my arms are too short to box with God. And a lot of people do that when they're angry at God, and they shake their fists at him like they want to fight God. The mind of the flesh is hostile to God. But through Christ, there is reconciliation. There is peace between us and God. But there's also reconciliation between us and others. The bond of peace extends between us and others. And we don't have time to unpack this, but it also brings peace within ourselves. A lot of times people who are living by the flesh are in conflict because there's just part of them that tells them we, that they're doing wrong. And yet, and so they f they're fighting within themselves. And that we don't, like I said, we don't have time to unpack that. But a bond of peace 
is a bond that's unique to spiritual brothers and sisters. And so we are charged to make every effort to be diligent, to guard it, to maintain it. Because the bond of peace is the DNA of unity of the spirit. You got to have the bond of peace in order to have unity of the spirit. And so we're told to make every effort to guard it, to keep it, to maintain it. Don't let it go easily. Be diligent about keeping it. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, peace doesn't happen by default. Peace is made by people wanting to live in harmony and with respect for each other, preferring others over self, as Paul instructs in Philippians chapter 2. The bond of peace Paul writes about is a mutual relationship that results from a kinship through the blood of Jesus. As he wrote to the Colossians, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Christ, and through him, Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The bond of peace comes through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. The cross, you know, picture a cross. The cross reaches upward, and then it reaches outward. Reconciliation with God brings reconciliation with others. It's how we can remember the cross. The picture of the cross is the way that we can remember the reconciliation that the cross offers. So a few questions. Why is every effort given to preserve, guard the unity of the spirit? Why do we have to be diligent about that? And who are we, from whom or from what are we protecting unity? The answer is that unity is constantly under attack by spiritual forces. The lion is always at the door of the church wanting entrance to destroy it. A church just down the road, uh, you know, one of the strongest churches when I was growing up, has recently had a falling out. And people have, have left, and, and it's a sad, sad situation because they let the division in, and the unity of the spirit has been destroyed. Hopefully, it can be rebuilt, but that will take a major effort, and it will take some time. But nothing is impossible with God. Here's a little, you've probably heard about situations like this, but uh, Brian Jennings writes that when I first came to Tulsa, the wise, or the wise counsel and gentle spirit of Chuck Thomas drew me to him. He said, one time while Chuck was recovering from surgery, he told me a story I'd never heard. While in Bible college, Chuck was invited to preach at the First Christian Church near Gotibo, Oklahoma, for several Sundays while they searched for a new preacher. And Chuck accepted the interim position and drove to the small town the following Sunday. The church, both the building and the people, seemed split down the middle. Each side had its own communion table. Each side had elders who separately prayed and served their half of the congregation. This strange division bewildered Chuck and his wife, Anita. Well, a friendly family invited him over for Sunday lunch, and after eating, Chuck asked about the obvious division. To his surprise, the family knew there was a division, but they didn't know why. And so they got on the phone and tracked down the answer from their grandmother. So you're talking three generations here that this has been going on. Well, it seems many years earlier, the congregation voted to install new carpet. And you, you know, I don't know how many times I've heard illustrations about people fighting over the color of the carpet. And half of the congregation wanted blue, the other half wanted rose. Sounds like red and blue, like Republican, Democrat. And uh, by the way, I heard a meme the other day that said, don't worry about the donkey and the elephant, just remember that you belong to the lamb. Good point. Anyway, the dispute led to a split church. They put blue carpet in half of the church building and rose carpet in the other half, and families stayed on their carpet and only shared communion with their like-minded friends. Even after the carpet was updated, folks kept to their sides. 
one church, two bunkers. Well, he talks about how Chuck began to preach a sermon on forgiveness, and the next week he preached the same sermon, and the next week he preached the exact same sermon, and he was ready to get up to preach sermon number four, forgiveness, when he thought, here we go again. When it came time for communion, heart yielded to the Spirit. One of the elders, with tears in his eyes, wailed, wait, I can't do this anymore. And he walked to the other side, extended his hand, and asked one of the other elders for forgiveness. The other elder didn't offer his hand. No. Nah. The other elder embraced him with both arms. And people in the congregation started doing the same thing. Forgiveness was requested and granted. Tears flowed. Joy erupted. By the time people returned to their seats, it was almost lunchtime, and Chuck pulled his sermon notes out of his Bible and just tossed them on the pew. He walked to the pulpit, led the Lord's Prayer, and dismissed with prayer. And for, first, for the first time in years, the people went home in peace. Satan is just doing what he wants, you know, it will do whatever he can to crash in and to destroy unity. And we must do due diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace that comes through Jesus. So what must each person practice in order for unity to happen and to remain? Very quickly, first of all, practice humility, Philippians chapter 2. This humility is a value higher in importance than me. Humility says, this is us. This is we. And so, secondly, we can keep that higher purpose in mind. Remember John Kennedy's phrase, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Keeping others first, valuing other people, submitting, yeah, tough word, submitting where possible, being humble in order to maintain the bond of unity in the spirit. Thirdly, have an awareness of Satan's methods. So be constantly aware that Satan is going to use whatever he can to divide the church. Fourthly, be engaged. Paul says, make every effort. In other words, don't sit back. Get out there and get engaged. Be on the lookout for what Satan is doing to try to destroy the church. Don't just coast along in your faith. Get involved and keep, guard, preserve the unity of the Spirit. And fifthly, don't leave it to the professionals. And that kind of is a, a sub-encouragement sub from the one before. You know, get up and do something. Don't think that it's just up to the preacher, it's just up to the elders. No, it's up to each of us to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then Ephesians chapter 4, I don't want to take time to read it here, but when, you know, Paul's talking about the body and how each part person plays a part. We talked about maturing and perfecting in maturity. And so we each grow in Christ and we grow toward that maturity in Christ, not you know, like the Corinthians, where Paul said, well, you're just children. You're just acting like kids. You're just little children. Well, no. We're growing up in the Spirit. We're growing up in Christ. And we're each playing our part. We're integral, in, integral to the wholeness of the body of Christ. One last little anecdote Jennings writes, Aided by the cover of darkness, the Australian 50th Infantry Battalion rushed toward the German trenches 
in the Battle of villers bretonneau That's how I'm going to say it. It's French. April 24th, 1918. So it's a true incident. Despite heavy gunfire, they pressed on. And as they neared the trenches, someone cried in order to bomb the trenches. Well, grenades flew through the air, crawls turned into runs, and soon the soldiers were killing and were being killed by the enemy in the trench. Except they weren't fighting the enemy. There were no German soldiers in the trench, only British soldiers, unaware that help was coming. The Allies killed one another. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called the children of God. Making peace is what we are called to do in the name of Christ. And one of our methods for making peace is to introduce people to Jesus. Because that, in the Bible, is the only division. You know, it's just people who know Jesus and people who don't know Jesus. And our goal and purpose is to reach out to them so that we're on the same side. And that all division is gone to the reconciliation of Christ. Only Jesus can make peace through his blood shed on the cross. And for we who are in the body of Christ, who are on the same side, we need to be diligent and working to maintain the peace as children of God. Thus be peacemakers. Satan will always be trying to stir up trouble and lead God's children into the sins of the flesh which includes dissensions and factions, division. And we are called to combat division as desperately as a mother guarding her child from a dangerous predator or a killer virus. We must make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Blessed are you, peacemaker. You are a child of God. So live your faith life and let it be one of making peace, of keeping peace. Amen. <laughs>